Hello, and welcome to our module on stimulus response compatibility. So we've talked a great deal already about response selection, and it's a fairly easy stage to think about because you're deciding which response to make. So we talked about the Hick-Hyman law, how it affects the duration of response selection, and today we're going to talk about how stimulus response compatibility also affects the duration of response selection. So if we go back to our three-stage model or five-stage model of information processing, we're still talking about that middle stage, response selection. So everything we're talking about in this module, like the Hick-Hyman uh, module, is about the duration and the difficulty of response selection. So first, we're going to talk about compatibility, uh, give a few examples of compatibility in the real world. And many of these examples are examples um, of poor compatibility in the real world, when things don't go as, uh, as they should because of an incompatibility between a stimulus and a response. So the first example I'd like you to take a look at uh, is a flight of stairs uh, at the New York City subway. So feel free to pause me and the link for this video is in the description. All right, well, welcome back. I can give you an update about those city stairs. They have been fixed in case, you know, you're hoping to go to New York and, and see them for yourself. Uh, they have been fixed so that all the stairs are uh, equal height. So there, there shouldn't be as many tripping incidents as there were before. So stimulus response compatibility can be a little silly. I mean, it's kind of a funny example. Uh, it can also be serious. You can imagine someone tripping and having a serious injury. You know, that would be uh, a big problem and a, a potential lawsuit for the city. Uh, but there also are examples of stimulus response comp compatibility that are even more dire. And a great example of that is aviation safety. Now, what you're looking at here is a plane crash. Uh, this is from several years ago. Uh, it was British Midland Flight 92. Uh, you can probably find a little documentary about it on YouTube. But it was Boeing. Uh, the, it was a Boeing aircraft, a 737 Model 400. That will be important a little later. And this was back in 1989. And this airplane was attempting an emergency landing, and unfortunately, it didn't make it back uh, to the runway. So this is a very serious incident. There were 126 people aboard, uh, 47 died, and 74 had uh, serious injuries. So obviously uh, a very serious and unfortunate accident. And the question here is, of course, you know, well, what happened? And we're going to see that stimulus response compatibility played a role. So the airplane took off. Uh, everything was fine, made it to its cruising altitude of 35,000 feet. And then what happened is the left engine broke. And this airplane had two engines, so it can still fly with one, but the protocol is that they, you um, return or land at the nearest airport possible. So when the left engine broke, it began to vibrate uh, and smoke came out. So it was very obvious that something was wrong. So the captain, um, what he wanted to do was turn off the left engine and use the right engine to make an emergency landing. But unfortunately, he turned off uh, the wrong engine. He turned off the right engine, uh, the working engine. Paradoxically here though, when he did that, the vibrations and the smoke stopped. So he got feedback that he had turned off the proper engine when in fact he hadn't. Now they didn't have a left engine, they turned off the working engine, so they had no engines. And uh, without either engine, they didn't make it back uh, to the runway. So how did this captain, a very experienced captain, he had uh, 13,000 hours of flying experience. I'm not sure how many years that takes to accrue, but it sounds like a lot. You know, how did he turn off uh, the wrong engine? And it comes down to partially stimulus response compatibility. Also, you know, high stress and potentially even fatigue playing a role in this situation as well. So here's a view of uh, that cockpit from the 737-400 at least. You know, at that uh, time, this is what the cockpit looked like. And adding to the difficulty is different 737s had different cockpits. So a, a pilot would get into the cockpit and maybe on the first flight, they're flying a Model 400. Maybe the next one's a Model 300. 
and they would have to constantly adapt, which you know isn't great. It, they should be consistent. They should be the same, and they should be as compatible as possible. So what the captain was looking for here is these two dials showed whether there was a problem with the left engine or the right engine. So if there's a problem with the left engine, then if you want to turn off the left engine, you would pull this lever. And if there's a problem with the right engine, then you would pull this lever. Seems easy enough, but in the high stress situation, what happened is the pilot saw a problem with the left engine and just kind of went straight back to maybe what the most compatible lever is to this stimulus, you know, it's the closest one, pulled that, turned off the wrong engine, got feedback that it fixed the problem, but then of course they're flying without two engines. So what would be a more compatible design? And other versions of the 737 at the time had this layout, where this uh, dial shows you if there's a problem with the left engine and you would pull the left lever, and this one shows you if there's a problem with the right engine and you would pull that lever. And the increase in compatibility in this layout may have prevented this accident. So stimulus response compatibility can be very serious. A few more funny or, or less serious examples are USB drives or USB uh, plugs in, in general. So when I teach in person and I go to class and plug in my USB drive, I always have to look, okay, which way does the drive line up? Uh, which way does the port work? Because it will only fit in one direction and not the other direction. And that seems like a bad design. So it's, it's unidirectional and what would be better would be a port that's bidirectional. And thankfully we have that now. So this sort of plug is, is USB-A, you know, it's kind of the original USB that is probably still the most predominant. But a lot of cell phones uh, and some computer things are switching to USB-C. And what I love about USB-C is it's bidirectional. You, know, you can plug it in this way or that way, it just works. And that's a much better design. You know, am I gonna you know, lose my life or if, if, uh, if I don't get the drive plugged in the first time? No, you know, is class gonna be canceled? No, you know, maybe just waste a second or two. Uh, but still this, this USB-C is, because it's bi-directional, is a more compatible design than, than USB-A. So I, I hope we'll see uh, fewer USB-A devices as, as we move forward. Another kind of funny one is the QWERTY keyboard. And I don't know if you've thought about this before, but you might wonder why are the keys arranged as they are on a standard QWERTY keyboard? And it's named as such because the keys in the top left uh, spell out QWERTY. So you might think that those keys are arranged to be the most compatible so that we can type as fast as possible. That would make sense, but it's not actually why they're in that order. Now the history isn't completely clear, but the most common story is that originally um, we didn't design keyboards, we designed typewriters. And they were, they were manual typewriters at first. You may have seen electronic typewriter. You have to go back further when uh, typewriters uh, were manual. You know, they didn't, they didn't plug in, they didn't have batteries. And what would happen is you'd press a key and an arm would come up, uh, a mechanical you know, lever would come up and it would hit the ink ribbon and that would leave the impression of the letter on your paper. So it was a mechanical uh, process. And what they found is as uh, people learned how to use um, a typewriter, because of course, you know, when these are invented, everyone was very slow at them. But some people like typists who use them several hours a day got quite good at them. And the problem is as they got faster, if you would press two keys in quick unison, one arm would come up, the other arm would come up, and they would jam together. And then, you know, you had to get your finger in there, you get ink on it, you probably messed up what you're typing, so maybe you have to start over. It was a problem. So the engineer said, okay, well, how can we solve this? And they said, well, the problem is that people are typing too fast. What if they can't type as fast? <laughs> it's kind of a, a funny solution, but it is one solution. So they said, okay, let's arrange the keys in a very inconvenient way so that you can't type very fast. And that is how QWERTY came to be. So if we look at the QWERTY layout, 32% of your typing is in the home row. And ideally, you would do most of your typing in the home row because you don't have to move your fingers as far. Also with QWERTY, you type a little bit more with your left hand than your right hand, 
which is slower for the majority of the population that are right hand dominant. So QWERTY has just survived to this day, even though it's no longer an issue. You know, we don't use mechanical keyboards and, you know, digital keyboards, I don't really think you can, you know, type too fast for them. At least humans can't type too fast for them. So do we have a better keyboard layout? Yes, and there's actually people who still research this. But one fairly common one is Dvorak. And in, in Windows, you can actually, and probably all operating systems, you can change and say, hey, I've got a Dvorak keyboard and you can use this layout. And it has shown uh, to be more efficient. So notice that most of the typing is in the home row. And you can see the most common letter in the English language is E, and there it is uh, in, in the home row. A little surprise it's not with the right hand, uh, but there it is with the left hand. Down here in QWERTY, you can see that E was left hand, bad, and outside of the home row, bad. So that's going to slow you down. And with Dvorak, a little uh, higher probability of your typing is with your right, usually dominant hand for most individuals compared to your left. So with Dvorak, you know, you can type faster. So why haven't we switched to this? Well, they've done some calculations and they've, they've realized that if, let's say, it's 2023, we say everyone is going to switch to Dvorak. Well, everyone would be really slow, right? Because we're all used to QWERTY. So that would hurt productivity. And then eventually we get faster and faster until we reach our QWERTY speeds and then we get even faster. So we'd be more productive. But what they've estimated is the, the cost to switching um, would be larger than the benefits provided by Dvorak. So that's the economical reason we all haven't switched to Dvorak. If we're gonna do this at some point, uh, what, what I think they should do is just say, okay, starting in 2023, everyone born that year will start using Dvorak uh, devices. And then QWERTY will eventually die out as all of us uh, die. Uh, now, the weird thing there is there'd be a few years where uh, say, you know, your child wouldn't be able to use the same laptop as you because you know, you're used to QWERTY and they're used to Dvorak. But maybe one day uh, we'll, we'll, we'll make that switch. Another example, and these can be uh, important for safety reasons, are street signs. I used to show this example when I taught at another university and I thought, you know, this is a crazy street sign. It, it's probably, you know, don't really exist in, in very many places. And then I moved to Lubbock <laughs> and sure enough, around the loop, you see a lot of street signs like this. So think about this situation. You've got, I think it's two lanes of traffic coming in and you're gonna split into five lanes, not a long distance, and you're traveling at a fairly high speed. I think the speed limit in, in, in most parts of the, the loop side road or service road, not sure the exact terminology, uh, is, is 50 uh, miles per hour. And now that I've lived in Lubbock for a while, I'm very used to this and it's not too hard to navigate this situation. But when I first moved here, uh, it was a, a bit of a shock. Oh, two lanes turning into five? What's going on? If I want to turn left, well, I could choose two lanes. And then I had never actually seen turnaround lanes before. They're not very common uh, elsewhere. Uh, well, I've never seen them in Canada. And students have told me before that these are referred to Texas turnarounds. So I'm not even sure how common they are uh, in, in other states. And I remember coming to this intersection for the first time and I'm like, what is this? Like, uh, you just do a UE? And now I think they're very convenient, but you know, these signs to the uninitiated um, take a long time to process and that's not ideal in a fast traffic situation, especially if there's lots of other cars on the road. Now I have three other bonus examples of compatibility in the real world and I won't go through these, but if you want to look at any or all of these, there's a few slides uh, and, and videos dedicated to each. So the first are poorly designed doors, which I'm sure you've come across in your life before, also called Norman doors. The second one is the 2000 presidential election. And if you thought the 2020 presidential election was controversial, well, the 2000 presidential election was actually decided by the Supreme Court. So, you know, it was, it was quite a, a contentious election. And number three, roundabouts, you know, love them or hate them, there's more appearing in Lubbock. Uh, so you may find that interesting. So if you'd like to go through those, feel free to, to pause me now, but I'm going to jump ahead to after those three bonus examples, which you know, will not uh, be on the test.
Okay, so these real-world examples of compatibility we've talked about so far are not really a topic of investigation within motor behavior. There is a, a field that specifically looks at these and it's called human factors um, or sometimes cognitive uh, ergonomics. And most universities have a, a department that focuses uh, on this area of research. At Texas Tech, it's part of psychological science and it's called human factor psychology. I believe they have undergraduate courses and they definitely have graduate programs uh, as well. Um, so it's a very interesting area of science and, and, and maybe something you'd like to, to learn more about. But what we're going to transition to is more an investigation of stimulus response compatibility from a motor behavior and a cognitive psychology perspective. And I'll, I'll show you what, what I mean by that. So first of all, we've talked a lot about stimulus response compatibility, you know, how is it defined? There's a few different definitions. These are all fairly synonymous. So you could think of it as the degree of natural or learned correspondence between a stimulus and a response. And the learned part here is interesting because when we're born, there are some things that we automatically find compatible, like left going with left, right going with right. We'll see that example soon. Other things we learn through exposure, like in North America, that flicking a light switch up will turn a light on that we actually learn. In the UK and Europe, in most places, uh, what the association learned there is that flicking a light switch down will turn a light on. So if I went to Europe, you know, I would find that incompatible. Another example, degree to which the relationship between a stimulus and a response is consistent with expectations. Or the third, maybe my, my fear, because it's the shortest, is the degree of naturalness between a stimulus and a response. So what happens when a stimulus and response are compatible? Well, reaction time is shorter or faster. That example is in bold because we're going to see that in, in several examples. Two, errors are decreased. We've already seen that in some of the, um, the, the airplane example. Three, learning is faster. And four, user satisfaction is higher. So imagine if you're involved in product design, you want to make your device compatible because uh, people are going to like to use it and it's going to be easy to use. So let's look at spatial compatibility, kind of the origins of it in terms of cognitive psychology. And some of this very foundational research came from uh, Paul Fitz. He looked at the compatibility in spatial arrangements and controls and displays or between stimuli uh, and responses. And this started out very fundamental in Paul Fitz's lab, but actually within a few years, he started to apply this to the design of cockpits and aviation safety. Let me just look up my notes here on Paul Fitz. We'll actually see Paul Fitz twice in this course because he's fairly famous for his contributions to science. So Paul Fitz lived from 1912 to 1965, and there's actually a law named after him, Fitz Law, and we'll see that later on in the course. He was a lieutenant colonel in the US Air Force, and he was one of the founders of this new area post-World War II called human factors engineering or cognitive ergonomics. So we'll look at some of his foundational experience, uh, experiments, but then he went on to look a lot at aviation uh, safety. Before Paul Fitz's time, when something needed to be designed or engineered, so think about uh, an airplane, a cockpit fairly complex, the engineers would design the cockpit layout in the easiest way to, to wire or to, to physically bring to life. And often that would be challenging for the human. The human, you know, the pilot would come in, you know, it was a weird display that maybe makes sense to the engineers and how everything connects, but it was challenging for uh, the human. And Paul Fitz's revelation was, well, what we should do is we should engineer it to work for the human. And yes, that's going to be a little more work and effort for the engineers and uh, you know how things are arranged. But then when the human comes in, it's going to be very intuitive, natural, or compatible. And that's very important uh, for, for safety, as we've seen. So here's a foundational experiment by Paul Fitz. And I think to us nowadays, I think we have a kind of a basic appreciation for 
stimulus response compatibility even though you've maybe never thought of it in those terms. So this experiment might seem a little obvious, but at the time it was you know, foundational, uh, groundbreaking, and, and was iterated upon to eventually cause things like better cockpit uh, design. So in this experiment, a participant would come in and they would do nine different conditions. So these are two different conditions shown here. So in this condition, you're making a response in this star pattern. So it's this pattern here. And the stimuli that you see are in this, this circular or also a star pattern. So uh, we're, we're seeing a combination of this response and this stimulus, and here are the results for the experiment. So what would happen is you had a, a stylus, you know, think of pencil, that you would hold in the middle. And what would happen is one of these lights would turn on. So let's say it was the top light. That's your go signal, and as quickly and accurately as possible, you would need to move your stylus to the matching position, to that top position. So it's a fairly straightforward reaction time task. What they looked at is what the average reaction time was. So in this sort of setup, the average reaction time was 390 milliseconds, and how many mistakes were made. So light turned on and you went to the wrong location. And participants were told to try to be very fast, and that's why there were some mistakes. You know, if you really take your time, you'd probably make no mistakes. So if we look at uh, this stimulus pattern, so you've got these stimuli, you could do circular responses, you could do this square response pattern, that's a little odd. So if the top light turned on, you would move here. If this light uh, turned on, you'd have to move to the corner and you could either go this way and then that way or that way and this way. Or uh, you, here's the stimulus, same stimulus, but now you've got this bimanual response pattern actually shown down here where you've got two styli, and if the top turns on, you'd move your right hand forward. If top right turned on, you'd have to move this hand up and this hand to the right. So if we look at you know, this, this top row here, then the fastest or shortest reaction times were shown for this stimuli and this response. And notice that they're both circular. So if the stimulus and the response match, you have the shortest reaction time and you make the fewest errors. Now let's look at this second row here. So what if we have the kind of this, this uh, you know, square or diamond shape? Well, with these stimuli, what was best is if you have this square or diamond shape response grid. So see here that the best performance was when, again, the stimuli and the response matched. They had the same pattern to the two of them. Now what about if you have stimulus that are Kind of, you know, horizontal and vertical, you know, that's different. And you're going to be fastest when you have an equally matching or equally odd uh, response where you're using two, two hands, you know, one horizontal and one vertical. So as you can see with these stimuli, the best type of response uh, was the one that matched the stimulus. So when the stimulus and response match or when they're compatible, you have short reaction times and few errors. So the the first two points we talked about for stimulus response compatibility. This is very simple, but we're going to build on this to learn more about how the brain works. Now, FITS built on this to engineer you know, safer products, specifically airplanes, but we're going to focus more on what we can learn about how the brain and the mind works from these sorts of experiments. So why study stimulus response compatibility outside of applying it to you know, human factors engineering? Well, compatibility effects are pervasive effects, evidence in performance of simple laboratory tasks. That's what we'll see more of, um, similar to FITS experiment. We'll actually look at something even easier. Everyday perceptual motor interactions. So think about walking through a, a well-designed door or a poorly designed door and complex human-machine interactions. So, you know, flying an airplane, but even driving a car, that's a fairly complex uh, human-machine interaction. For cognitive psychology, the real key here is that they provide a measure of and theoretical insight into basic cognitive processes that occur during response selection. So we can learn more about response selection by studying compatibility. Just like in the previous model uh, module, we learn more about response selection by studying the Hick-Hyman law. So let's look at the most fundamental compatibility task. It's a two-choice reaction time task. So you can use your two hands or, or 
maybe just your two fingers, depending on the size of the buttons. And you're going to get a stimulus on the left or the right, and you're going to make a response with your left or your right hand. And in one condition we call the ipsilateral condition, if a stimulus appears on the left, you should press the left button. So ipsilateral meaning same side. Stimulus on the left, response on the left, both same sides. And if a stimulus appears on the right, in the ipsilateral condition, you would press the right button. So that's ipsilateral uh, two-choice reaction time task. In another condition, we tell participants that if a stimulus appears on the left, you should press the right button. We call that contralateral mapping because the stimulus and response are on opposite sides. So here's an example of those two mappings. So ipsilateral, and we've pretty much seen this before, it's kind of our standard two-choice reaction time task. The newer condition is the contralateral mapping. And as you may have guessed, reaction time is going to be longer here and you might make more mistakes if you're really trying to be fast at this task. But let's try these two conditions for ourselves so you can see what it feels like. So first let's do the ipsilateral mapping. So you can use your hands on your desk or even just on your lap to make a response. So this is the ipsilateral block. So if there's a stimulus on the left, make a left response. Stimulus on the right, make a wrong, right response. We're going to do four trials. So here's the first one. Everyone ready? Okay, here we go. Okay, trial two. Trial three. And one more. Great. So think about how long your reaction time felt there. Now we're going to try the contralateral block and see whether your reaction time feels you know, shorter, the same, or faster. <laughs> Sorry, shorter, the same, or slower. Longer. <laughs> I'm mixing up longer, shorter, and faster, and slower. Okay, Let's see if your reaction time feels different. <laughs> so here we go, contralateral. So if there's a stimulus on the left, make a right response. Stimulus on the right, make a left response. Here we go. Okay, so did reaction time feel longer or slower in the contralateral or what we call incompatible condition? Probably should have felt that way. It's usually a big enough difference, about 100 milliseconds on average, that you can feel that difference. Uh, but I promise you, if we brought you into the lab, you know, recorded your reaction time over a series of trials, your mean reaction time on incompatible trials would be longer than compatible trials. So what's happening here in terms of information processing? So think about the ipsilateral mapping, we also call that compatible. Well, your reaction time is relatively short because response selection is also short. It's easy for your brain to say left stimulus, left response. It's compatible. In the incompatible mapping or the contralateral mapping, what happens is your reaction time is longer. And it's longer because response selection gets longer. So stimulus identification is about the same duration. Response programming is about the same duration. We've keyed in on changing one state, response selection. So with a contralateral mapping, you see a left stimulus and your brain has to say, okay, wait a second, left stimulus, right response. That incompatibility extends response selection, thus making your reaction time longer. So those are our two mappings, ipsilateral, contralateral. We can also think of this as being compatible and this one being incompatible. So let's think about doing a compatibility experiment. I'd like you to understand kind of where we get the data that we're gonna see later and graph, you know, how that data comes to be. So think about going into the lab, you're gonna do two blocks. And let's say in your first block, you have an ipsilateral mapping and in this, short experiment you know there's just 14 trials in each block so you'll do 14 trials and each trial is randomized whether it's going to be uh, requiring a left response or a right response and on those 14 trials will measure your reaction time you would then do a second block a contralateral block again with in this example 14 trials so here's your ipsilateral block and what we need to do is sort those trials so seven of them was a, a left stimulus and a left response, so I've, I've sorted those seven, and then the other, stim the other seven required a right response to a right stimulus, so those are those seven. 
And now what we do is we calculate your mean reaction time in these two different conditions. So these seven values, the mean is 310 milliseconds. Over here, the mean is 307. We would also have data from your contralateral block. So it would be you know, 14 trials. We'd sort them into left stimulus, right response, right stimulus, left response, and we calculate your means. So we've got four means. That's our, our important data here. And by convention, what we do is we put them into this two by two table. And you'll see more examples of this. So here we have the stimulus position. Is it a left stimulus or a right stimulus? And then we have our response position. Did you make a left response or a right response? So if we look at these first two values here, note that these values are both from the ipsilateral or compatible condition. So uh, on, on a diagonal here. So this is a left stimulus, left response. So 310 coming from here. And down here we have a right stimulus, right response. So the compatible mean reaction times here are on uh, this diagonal. And on the other diagonal, we have your mean reaction times in the contralateral mapping or the incompatible mapping. So 386 goes there, 377 goes here. So it's a little bit odd kind of how the data goes into this table, uh, but you need to get used to it because we're going to be using this table over and over. We now have our data in a table and what we'd like to do is graph our data. So we're going to create a graph. We'll put our dependent variable on the y-axis. This is convention. You put your dependent variable on the x-axis. Now, if you're confused over which one's the independent and dependent variable, well, the dependent variable depends on the participant's uh, reaction times. So we don't know it in advance. What's reaction time going to be? Well, it depends on the participant. So reaction time is our dependent variable. We actually have two independent variables, and one of them we're going to put here on the x-axis. So response position, are you making a left response or a right response? We have another independent variable, and that's the stimulus position. So to convey both of these, we're going to put stimulus position into a legend. Is it a left stimulus or a right stimulus? Now make sure you don't mix up the location of these, although you could technically make that graph. Uh, by convention, it's not how it's done, and it would be contrary to everything we're going to look at. So response position on the x-axis, stimulus position in a legend. Okay, so we've got our data, and these are going to be four data points on this graph. So if we look at our first point here, 310, this is a left response, so we're going to have to plot it over here in this, on the left side, and it is a left stimulus, so we're going to want to plot a blue triangle. So at 310, Right about here, we're going to put a blue triangle there. So there's our first data point. Okay, second data point, let's go with this one. So this is a left response. So again, we're going to focus on the left side. It's going to go somewhere here. It's a right stimulus, so it's going to be a red square. And we have to go up to 377. So right about here, and we plot that data point. So halfway done here. Next one, let's look at this data point. So it's a right response. So we're now on to the right side of the graph. It's so a left stimulus, blue triangle, and it needs to go at 386, which is going to be about here. Oh, a little bit off, about here. And our last data point, still a right response. It is a right stimulus, so it should be a red square. And that's going to be at 307, which will be our lowest point around here. There we go. Now, the last convention thing we do is we draw a line connecting the like stimuli together. So we're going to connect the two red squares with a line and the two blue squares with a line. And this is how we plot the standard spatial compatibility experiment. And sometimes we refer to the results as the spatial compatibility effect. So notice that it kind of looks a bit like an X. And we're going to talk more about this. What might help when you're new to these graphs is to put on either some labels or pictures so you understand what these four points represent. So if we go down here, remember this is a left response and it's a left stimulus. So you can draw on that condition to help you remember that, okay, we're talking about a left response, so you respond with your left hand to a left stimulus. And now with that pitron, it's a little easier to say, oh yeah, this is the ipsilateral compatible condition, so it makes sense that it has a short reaction time. Up here, this is uh, still a left response, but it's a right stimulus. 
and this is the contralateral or incompatible condition, so it makes sense that it has a slower reaction time. And we can put on the labels, or sorry, the figures over here, so we can understand, yep, this is the ipsilateral condition, this is the contralateral condition, and it makes sense that you have a shorter reaction time for the ipsilateral condition. So I think now is a good time to take a break and dive into the first section of the practice questions where you'll be making some stimulus response compatibility graphs. I believe there's three. So feel free to pause me, open up the practice questions uh, to make sure that you've understood the content uh, thus far. Okay, so carrying on, after we make these graphs, we have to ask an important question, we ask the same question twice. And the question is, is there a compatibility effect? And I've separated this from graphing because sometimes students get a little confused about this second step. So you're gonna look at your graph and say, is there a compatibility effect? So there is a compatibility effect when the ipsilateral compatible condition has a shorter reaction time than the contralateral incompatible condition. So when the data makes sense, you know, ipsilateral is faster than contralateral, we say there's a compatibility effect. Now, if we run a standard compatibility experiment, we should see compatibility effects unless something goes really wrong. But what I'm going to challenge you with is showing you data that isn't necessarily perfect, or maybe the experimenters did something a little bit odd, you know, maybe they tested aliens, you know, something like that. Because uh, we really, we should look at the data and try to understand it. And in this case, we do that by asking, is there a compatibility effect? You can actually ask that question twice, once for the left response and once for the right response. So let's look at what I mean by that. So back to the graph uh, that we, we did together, we can look over at the left response here. So we're gonna focus, oh, here, I've added uh, labels in as well to be very clear about the conditions. You know, you could label this as compatible or ipsilateral. This one is incompatible or contralateral. So if we look at the left response, we say, is there a compatibility effect? Well, yes, there is because the data makes sense. The compatible reaction time is faster than the incompatible reaction time. So we say, yes, there is a compatibility effect uh, for the left response. What about for the right response? Well, over here, we're gonna focus just on the right. And here reaction time, yes, it is shorter for the compatible or ipsilateral condition compared to the incompatible or contralateral condition. And this, is, this makes sense, that's what we expect. So we say, yes, there is a compatibility effect for the left response. And this is what we expect in this standard experiment. But it's good to become practiced at looking at data and saying, you know, does this make sense? So let's look at some other examples where we may or may not see compatibility effects. So let's go back for a second. And remember, this compatibility effect looks like an X. Now what about this? Now we have a small x. Do we still have compatibility effects? Well, let's look here. This is the compatible condition. This is incompatible. Compatible is faster than incompatible. So yes, there is a compatibility effect with the left response. It's not as big in terms of difference in reaction time, but this one is still shorter than this one. We're not gonna worry about running statistics, just there's a visual difference. So there is a compatibility effect with the left response. With the right response, yep, the compatible condition is faster than the incompatible condition. So yes, we see also a compatibility effect with the left response. So don't just look for an X because it could be a small X or a big X. You need to interpret that. What about a slanted X? I guess, let's see, <laughs> I'm not sure <laughs> how to make this compatible with what you're seeing. Um, so let's look here. So yeah, oh yeah, compatible condition is shorter than incompatible, this makes sense. So we can say there is a compatibility effect with the left response. What about the right response? Yep, compatible, incompatible, this one's faster. So there is a compatibility effect for the left response. So you don't have to get a perfect X, it can be a small X, it can be a slanted X. Why would this happen? Well, maybe, you probably wouldn't see this extreme difference for say, someone who's right hand dominant, but maybe an individual had a stroke, it affected their left arm, uh, so their paretic arm is their left arm, they're very slow with it. Right arm is every, everything's faster. Uh, so you're slow with the left, fast with the right, but we still see two compatibility effects. 
Here we've gone away from the X pattern, so we're probably not going to see two compatibility effects. So if we look over here, incompatible is faster than compatible. That's weird. So we'd say no, there's not a compatibility effect for the left response. What about the right? Yes, compatible is faster than incompatible. So we'd say yes, there is a compatibility for the left response. So if you don't see an X, something might be off. Finally, here's an X. So you might say, oh yeah, compatibility effects. But this is actually an upside down X, if you will. So we say, okay, is there a compatibility effect over here at the left response? No, because incompatible is faster. What about for the right response? Is there a compatibility effect? No, because again, incompatible is faster. So don't just see an X and say, yep, two compatibility effects, because it could be an upside down X as in this example. So let's take another little break to do some practice questions where uh, in the previous practice questions you made three graphs and now what you'll do is you'll go and answer whether there are compatibility effects in those graphs. So what's going on with stimulus response compatibility? It seems obvious that left goes with left and right goes with right, but there's more here to learn about how the mind works and we're going to delve into that now. So first we'd say that stimulus and response sets are coded or represented in terms of their spatial locations. And when a stimulus and response code match, so if you see a left stimulus and it requires a left response, uh, reaction time is faster, uh, often there's fewer errors than when they don't match. So compatible versus incompatible or ipsilateral versus contralateral. So why does this happen? Well, as we've kind of hinted at a few times here, Stimulus response compatibility effects are attributed to more efficient translation between the stimulus and the response, specifically how long does response selection take. So a compatible condition, short response selection, therefore short reaction time. Uh, incompatible condition, longer response selection, therefore longer reaction time. But how can we explain this at a deeper level? And one way to do that is to talk about the dual process model. And this is a great explanation of compatibility effects. It applies to several different tasks uh, or, or experimental uh, tasks. And we'll see at least three that we're going to apply back to this model. Now this model is going to look a little busy, but the good news is it's based on you know, our three or five stage model of information processing, which we know uh, very well. Uh, we're going to see that there's kind of a split in processing, so there's parallel or, or dual roots of processing, but it's still really these three or five stages or sub-stages of information processing. I'm going to show you the full model, we're going to uh, step through it, uh, but I won't test you on the, on the model itself, but on your ability to apply the model. And I think that uh, is much easier than trying to remember, you know, where a dozen different boxes go in this model. So here's the model, and yes, it looks a little busy, but let's uh, go through it first uh, with a, an abstract example, and then we'll apply it to ipsilateral and contralateral mapping. So here, everything starts with encoding of the stimuli, and you can think of this as uh, stimulus detection. And the idea is that in the, the mind and the brain, from here, there's two roots of parallel processing. So information before, information processing was this one process, and here we actually say it splits in two. Up here we have very automatic processing. And it says, okay, based on stimulus detection, uh, what response should we select? And it's going to select the most automatic or reflexive decision. And then it's going to say, I'm going to go ahead and program that response. Meanwhile, the intentional process says, hey, I'm going to spend a little more time in stimulus identification. You can think of this kind of like uh, stimulus detection followed by stimulus identification. I'm going to think a little more deeply about what I see. And then I'm going to think about the instructions of the task when I select a response. It's not necessarily going to be the most automatic or reflexive. It's going to be related to the task instructions. Now these two pathways converge and they say, hey, do we want to do the same thing? So does this pathway, the automatic pathway, want to do the same thing as the intentional pathway? If they both want to do the same thing, great, let's go ahead and do it. 
We're going to initiate the response that was programmed by the automatic process. And because this doesn't take very many steps, we'll have a short reaction time. Now, what if they don't want to do the same thing? If they have a difference of opinion, we have to pick which process do we want to go with. And the brain or the mind decides, well, I'm going to go with the intentional process because it thought more deeply about the instructions. It just didn't say what's the most automatic. So we're going to go with what the intentional process wants to do. But the first thing we need to do is the automatic process already programmed its response. So we need to abort that response. We don't want to do it. Then we need to program the response that the intentional process wants to do. And then we can initiate that. So compared to uh, when the two pathways want to do the same thing, there's two extra stages, and that's going to increase reaction time. So a little bit complicated, right? Well, let's apply it to ipsilateral and contralateral mappings, and I think it will, will seem more straightforward. So here's the situation. Uh, you, you're given an ipsilateral mapping, so you're told, for example, if there's a left stimulus, you make a left response. So the, this stimuli appears, and the brain says, oh, yep, yeah, there's a stimulus on the left. Now the automatic process says, ooh, something is on the left. I want to make a left response, because that's compatible. That's automatic. That's reflexive. So it selects left and programs left. The intentional pathway says, oh, yeah, there's something on the left. Now what was I told? I was told if there's something on the left, make a left response. So I'll select left as well. These two pathways come together and say, hey, we both want to do left. Great. Go ahead and do it. So we initiate the response that had been programmed by the automatic pathway or process. Now what about when we give a participant um, contralateral mapping instructions? And let's say a stimulus appears on the left. Well, they're told that they should make a right response. So the brain says, hey, I see something on the left. The automatic process says something on the left. You know, I want to go left. So think of it as like a dog off a leash when a squirrel runs by. It just wants to chase it. <laughs> So it says, OK, you know, I want to chase that squirrel. I want to press left because there's something on the left. So I'm going to program that response. The intentional pathway says, oh, wait a second. What are the instructions? When there's something on the left, I should press right. I need to make a contra lateral response. So I'm going to select right. They come together and say, oh, we want to do different things. Well, let's trust the pathway or process that thought more deeply about the task. So we're going to have to abort the response programmed by the automatic process. We can then program the response selected by the intentional process. And then once it's programmed, we can initiate it. So we've got these two extra stages, so we're going to have a long reaction time. So when applying the dual process model, you can think about it kind of at this level. You don't have to remember you know, every box in that model. So the ipsilateral mapping, you can think about, OK, well, what is the automatic response when something's on the left? Well, it'd be to press left. What's the intentional response? It's also left. So the automatic response, the intentional response is left. And because those match, you're going to have a short reaction time. In the contralateral mapping, as we just saw, the automatic response is left, but the intentional response is right. Those don't match, so the brain has to do some extra work to overcome that discrepancy. We need to kind of inhibit the automatic path and excite the intentional path. And that will cause a long reaction time. So this is kind of the level that you need to understand the dual process model. Let me show you another example of this. And you've probably seen this task before. It's the Stroop task. It's a fair, fairly famous psychology task. And here, what you're asked to do is name the ink color of the words. In the compatible condition, you might see uh, the, the, the word black, and the ink color of that is also in black. So here you should say black. So let's try this. So on the next slide, we're going to see a bunch of colors, and you just you know, read them as you would, you know, left to right and, and top to bottom, and say the, the, the colors aloud. And I'll, I'll try this too at the same time. OK, you ready? So name the ink colors of the words. Blue, red, yellow, green, black, yellow, blue, red, green, black, red, blue, yellow, black, blue, green. It was easy, right? Doesn't take very long at all. And that's because this is compatible. We'll relate it to the dual process model after we try the incompatible condition. So in this, the stimuli are more difficult. So here, you know, the word says green, but the ink color is red. And remember, you're supposed to say the ink color. So here you should say red and not green. 
so let's try this again. It's going to be the same sort of stimuli. Okay, name the in color. I gotta gotta motivate myself for this one. Green, blue, black, yellow, blue, red, black, green, red, blue, <laughs> yellow, black, green, yellow, red, blue. Much harder. You know, it's night and day. It's obvious that this one is a lot harder. And we can explain this with the, the dual process model. So when the stimuli uh, is the word blue written in blue, the automatic response is actually to read the word. And we've learned to read and practice reading so much that when we see something, we automatically want uh, to read it. So the automatic response, you're reading the word, you want to say blue. In this condition, the ink color is also blue. So uh, this is compatible or the automatic and the intentional processes want to do the same thing, so you're going to have a short reaction time. And that was like the first condition we tried, the compatible condition. Here's an example stimuli from the incompatible condition. So again, you automatically want to read it. So the automatic pathway you know, wants to say blue, and the intentional pathway says, no, 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 think about it. You're supposed to name the color of the ink, which is green. There's a conflict here, so you're going to have a long reaction time. So a second task where we can apply the dual process model, and we'll actually see a third one a little bit later. But a good point to check your understanding of the dual process model is to go to the practice questions, and I think there's just three where you'll apply the dual process model to ipsilateral contralateral mapping and also to the Stroop task. So, so far we've kind of accepted that the dual process model is correct, but there's actually an alternative hypothesis to explain compatibility effects, so ipsilateral being faster than contralateral, and that's neuroanatomical correspondence. And that really comes down to the way the brain uh, and body are wired, how the input comes into our brain, how the output goes out of our brain. So the first hypothesis is dual process model. We've seen this a few times. The idea is that Spatial compatibility effects are caused by the automatic and intentional processes. So that's our, our first hypothesis. The alternative hypothesis is related to neuroanatomical correspondence, and we'll look at this uh, in more detail next. But it uh, predicts that spatial compatibility effects are caused by the anatomical congruence between the cerebral hemispheres processing the, the stimulus and the response. So to understand this, we need to look at neuroanatomy. And we'll come back actually to this neuroanatomy when we talk more about the visual system. But here we're going to kind of look at uh, the neuroanatomy in, in fairly broad strokes. So you probably already know that if you want to move, say, your right hand, that the motor command for that action originates in the left primary motor cortex. Other motor areas are involved, but to simplify it, we can think of the primary motor cortex sending the command down to the right hand. So there's a crossing of that signal. It's contralateral. It begins in the right hemisphere, ends up in the left hand. Why does that happen? Well, it travels down the contralateral cortical spinal axons, which originate in the contralateral hemisphere as the response. They travel down through the brainstem, and at the, the, the lower levels of the brainstem, it crosses over, or the, the fancy word for that is decussates, to the opposite side, and then goes down to the, the, the appropriate level to go to the arm. So here, some, some cervical level. Um, so it crosses over, descends to the cervical uh, spinal cord, then travels out to innervate the uh, right arm. So there's a crossing to the output of the motor system. The output from uh, the, the left hemisphere controls the right hand and vice versa. Now what about the input? So think about a stimulus. So imagine you're looking straight ahead at this fixation and there's a stimulus in the right visual field. Well that information will actually travel back to the left primary visual cortex. And we're going to look at this pathway in much more detail when we talk about uh, the visual system. But for now all we need to know is that there's a, a contralateral mapping to the input as well. If there's something on the right visual field it ends up in our left primary visual cortex. And that's really just the beginning of visual processing 
It then travels to many more areas in occipital, parietal, even temporal uh, areas of the brain. If we saw something in the left visual field, that information ends up in our right primary visual cortex. So the input crosses and then the output crosses. So let's connect these two things uh, together. So imagine you're doing an ipsilateral mapping two choice reaction time task and something appears on the right. So a right stimulus is gonna require a right response. Now, how does that play out in the brain? So we have a right stimulus. It ends up going to our left primary visual cortex. From here, it goes up to the left primary motor cortex. And that, uh, coincidentally or conveniently, can control the right hand. So we can send that motor command out. So you can think of this as you know, one, two, three steps to get the motor command out to the hand. Now what happens in the contralateral mapping? So we'll stick with the right stimulus, but now you should make a left response. So the right visual stimulus goes to the left primary visual cortex. From here it goes up to the left primary motor cortex, but that can't control the left hand. It could control the right hand. So we're gonna have to send that information across to the right primary motor cortex, and this is an extra step. And then once we're there, we can then send the motor command out to make a left response. So here we kind of have four steps. Stimulus uh, to the primary visual cortex, up to the primary motor cortex, step two. Step three, we have to cross hemispheres. Step four, we can then control the hand. And more steps takes more time. So this could explain why contralateral is slower than ipsilateral. It's not saying, oh, you know, there's two processes in the mind, automatic and intentional. No, it's just saying, it's all about how the mind is, is wired, the neuroanatomy, hence the name neuroanatomical uh, correspondence. So the problem here is that if we think about the compatibility effect, neuroanatomical correspondence predicts that ipsilateral should be fast and contralateral should be slow. The dual process model also predicts that ipsilateral should be fast and contralateral should be slow. And because the results are the same and both predictions are the same, we can't say one is correct and one is incorrect. Ideally, what we'd like to do is design an experiment where they make opposite predictions. So if you see the red line is, is in this direction here, over here it's in the opposite uh, direction, or here it's a negative slope, here it's a positive slope. So if these two hypotheses made different predictions, we could then run an experiment, and this is just you know, made up here, and we could say, oh, the results, you know, if, if they look the same as this, then it would support this hypothesis. But if they look the same as this one, then it would support the other hypothesis. So we can't do that with the standard ipsilateral contralateral task because they predict the same results. But in a very genius cognitive psychology-like uh, experiment, we're going to see this lots of times, where we make a very simple change, almost seems like, What's the big deal at all that change is so small? And yet, it makes a huge difference for our, our models of, of the mind. So what we do is we ask participants to cross their hands. So you're gonna cross your hands and we'll give you an ipsilateral block. So now a left stimulus, you should make a left response, but note that is now done with your right hand. <laughs> and in the contralateral mapping, in this example, so if you have a left stimulus, you make a right response, same as before, but that is now done with your left hand because your left hand is, your hands are crossed. So how does this change our predictions? Well, the dual process model basically says, I don't care you know, if your hands are crossed or double crossed, left goes with left, right goes with right. So in the ipsilateral block, you should be fast and in the contralateral block, you should be slow. It says, I don't care what your hands have done. Now, neuroanatomical, it makes a big difference. If you think about crossing your hands, that changes the input-output relationship. So your hands are now crossed. You're doing the ipsilateral mapping. There's a stimulus on the right. It goes to the left primary visual cortex. From there, it goes to the left primary motor cortex. And here, we need to cross sides to go to the right primary motor cortex so that we can then send a signal out to the left hand. 
So now note that in the ipsilateral block, when your hands are crossed, it requires an extra step. So it says ipsilateral should be slow. In the contralateral mapping, neuro, uh, and the neuroantanical correspondence hypothesis, that's a mouthful, says that or predicts that uh, you should have a, a, a short reaction time. You should be fast. So if we have a stimulus on the right, it goes to the left primary visual cortex. From here, it goes up to the left motor cortex. We want to control the right hand, so we're already in the right hemisphere. So we can go ahead and send that signal out to the hand. So one, two, three steps. We don't have that extra step, so you should be fast at this task. So by crossing the hands, we now have completely different predictions for these two hypotheses. So we can now run the experiment and see which result is supported and which one uh, is, is refuted. So here are the predictions. So um, dual process model says the data is going to look like this, you know, ipsilateral fast, contralateral slow. Neuroanatomy says, well, we expect the opposite, contralateral fast, ipsilateral slow. So notice the negative slope to the red line here and the positive slope to the red line here. So here are the actual results. So take a moment and look at these and determine whether these resu results support the dual process model or the neuroanatomical correspondence hypothesis. And hopefully what you've come to is that these results support the dual process model because these are the ipsilateral conditions, oops, uh, and they're fast and contralateral is slow. That's what the dual process model predicted. So we made separate predictions. Here are the actual results and the actual results supported the dual process model. So in other words, the neuroanatomical correspondence hypothesis is incorrect. But you might be saying, well, how can that be? And I didn't lie about how visual stimuli comes into the brain and how um, the brain then controls the hands. Those crossings do occur. But what we see overall is the typical spatial compatibility effect, you know, when your arms are crossed, is about 100 milliseconds. So if we take contralateral reaction time, subtract ipsilateral reaction time, you know, ipsilateral uh, is, is shorter by about 100 milliseconds. And this 100 milliseconds is actually composed of two things. The first is that, yes, there is a cost for information to cross from one hemisphere to the other. So we can think of this as the neuroanatomical cost. And here, what you, you know, what you, we see is that when your hands are crossed, you're actually four seconds faster for contralateral or, or negative four the way we're plotting it here. So yes, there is a cost to cross the hemisphere, but it's very small. It's only four milliseconds. And remember, compatibility effects are huge. They're 100 milliseconds. So this small cost in the opposite direction can't explain what's happening here. The majority of the cost, and if we want the numbers to add up perfectly here, you know, there's 104 millisecond cost to the dual process model, to having to um, go through response selection uh, for a, a contralateral response when the arms are crossed. So does neuroanatomical play a role? Yes, but it's very small and it gets wiped out by the huge cost predicted by the dual process uh, model, giving us this large spatial compatibility effect. So we go back to our two hypotheses. The dual process model uh, is correct. Neuroanatomical correspondence, it's not completely false. That is happening, but it's such a small effect in the opposite direction, so it doesn't explain compatibility effects. It doesn't even come close. So there's a few questions on uh, neuroanatomy to help uh, reinforce uh, those concepts. So go ahead and try those now. So let's look at another example of stimulus response compatibility, and this is the Simon effect. And here we're gonna learn something about how our brain loves to code spatial location. So, so far, uh, the typical compatibility task, we've 
keep the arms uh, uncrossed to make it simple, has, has involved responding based on the stimulus location. So ipsilateral, if it's on the left, press left. Contralateral, if it's on the left, press right. But what's key is you need to decide, is the stimulus on the left or the right? That's, that's vital to the task. Now what about if the task doesn't require anything, um, the, the instructions don't involve the stimulus location that's irrelevant to the task. So here in this reaction time task, you're actually gonna respond to the stimulus feature. So not which side is it on, you know, left versus right, but what color is it? Is it blue or is it green? So in other words, the location of the stimulus is irrelevant. It still changes. Some trials, the stimulus will be on the left, sometimes on the right, but it actually doesn't matter to the task. What you're told is that if it's blue, regardless of it's left or right, you should make a response with the blue key, which happens to be on the left. And if it's green, again, doesn't matter if green's on the left or the right, you should press the green button. The question here is, will the spatial location still influence your reaction times, even though it's irrelevant to the task? So if reaction time is influenced by spatial location, these trials might be you know, compatible. So here, left goes with left, right goes with right. So maybe you'll have a shorter reaction time for these trials. And here in these trials, maybe these will be incompatible. You have slower reaction time because now a right stimulus is associated with a left response. So can your brain turn off uh, spatial information when it's irrelevant, like in this task called the Simon task? Uh, or is spatial location always influencing your responses? Why is this called the Simon task? Well, the task uh, was, was first designed and, and used by uh, you know, Professor J. Richard uh, Simon. Uh, so it be, was named, you know, uh, likely posthumously <laughs> after his death uh, in his, his honor. So what sort of predicted results do we have here? Well, let's say your brain turns off spatial coding in the Simon task because it's irrelevant to the task. In that case, it doesn't matter whether it's you know, ipsilateral or contralateral, reaction time should be identical for all four trials. So these you know, dots should really be right on top of each other, but I just separated them so they weren't you know, concealing each other. But if your brain still codes stimulus position, even though it's irrelevant to the task, we may see a typical compatibility effect where you're faster in ipsilateral conditions than contralateral conditions. So let's try the Simon task uh, for ourselves. And here I've actually gone with, with blue and red because uh, in, in class, the blue and green stimuli uh, didn't look very different on the projector. So what's gonna happen is the stimulus will appear either on the left or the right. It will either be blue or red. When it's blue, you should press, make a left response when it's red, make a right response. So if the blue is here, left response. If the blue is here, left response. Spatial location is irrelevant. All right, here we go. And think about uh, the, the type of trial. Was it ipsilateral or contralateral? And did it uh, affect your reaction time? So we'll try eight trials here. All right, everyone ready? Here we go. Okay, so let's go back to our predictions. Now, did your reaction time seem comparable regardless of whether the, the stimuli were say ipsilateral, the stimulus response were ipsilateral or contralateral? If so, then these, this is the, the prediction that the brain has turned off spatial coding. But if it felt easier to make responses when they happen to be ipsilateral than contralateral, the brain can't turn off spatial processing, then we would expect these results. Now the actual results, you may or may not have felt this uh, because it's a bit of a smaller reaction time difference, maybe 50 milliseconds. And this isn't a very well you know, controlled experiment you know, over the, <laughs> the internet. But if we brought you into the lab and did this, average together data from several people, what we see is what we call a Simon effect. 
that the ipsilateral responses, when it happens to be ipsilateral, you have a shorter reaction time, and when the responses happen to be contralateral, you have a slower reaction time. What we're seeing here is the brain cannot turn off spatial coding, and it would actually be beneficial to turn off spatial coding. It would be best if you had the same reaction time you know, for, for blue, regardless of whether it's on the left or the right. But the brain loves spatial information. There's lots of different experiments that show this. And even when it doesn't matter, your brain is still classifying or coding things as left and right. And if it codes something as left, it's faster when then it can make a compatible left response than say a right response. So the dual process model, we can use it again here to explain these effects. So in this, what we now can think of uh, as a compatible task, a blue stimulus requires a blue response. So here automatically, says uh, the automatic process says, hey, there's something on the left, I wanna make a left response. The intentional pathway says, oh, well, hold on, think about the color, it's blue, the blue button's on the left, so I should press left. Because these responses match, we have a short reaction time. In an incompatible condition, the automatic pathway says, ooh, there's something on the left, I wanna press left. The intentional pathway says, no, 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 it's not about the side, we need to think about the color. It's green, the green button's over here on the right, so I should press right. These responses don't match, so we're gonna see a long reaction time. So I really like the dual process model because it handles many different compatibility tasks. All right, finally, let's look at one kind of last fun slash controversial topic. So here we're seeing part of an art project called Our Kind of People by Beate Ross Smith. Might be pronouncing that first name wrong. But it examines perception based on appearance and deconstructs how clothing, race, gender, and class uh, signifiers affect our daily interactions and social systems. So the artist, you can actually contribute to this project. I'm not sure if it's ongoing or not. But it, um, he asked individuals to take a series of pictures of themselves wearing different outfits and then line them all up together and you can kind of think about um, how it's the same individual but what they're wearing affects your, your judgment of them. You know, you might see this individual and think, uh, oh, you know, if I ran into him in a dark alley, I wouldn't be afraid at all. Uh, but, you know, all of a sudden he's, you know, puts his hood up, uh, changes his clothes, and then you might be apprehensive about running into that person in the alley, even though it's, it's the same person. Now, how is this related to compatibility? Well, there's a task called the implicit association task that looks at this idea of, of bias or stereotypes. And it's controversial, although it's also very well known. The original uh, experiments came out of Harvard, so a very you know, prestigious university, and it's still used. Um, so on the, the IIT website, if you'd like to try it for yourself, there's lots of um, conditions, some benign, but the ones that get the most press are the controversial ones, like looking at, do you have a bias for race? So in other words, um, are you racist? You know, the idea is you can take this test and it will tell you whether you're racist and that that's extrapolating the research too far. And sometimes that happens in the news. They say, hey, there's a test that will tell you if you're racist. If you read the actual research, it's, uh, it's usually much more careful about uh, extrapolating the findings to, to that level. And we'll, we'll look at how this works. Um, these are some of the tests they, they've had before. Looking at weight, so um, do you have a, a preference for um, people of, who are obese or thin? Sexuality, implicit association tests, or presence? And this is the one we'll look at. And, and last I checked, it still was you know, Trump versus Obama, which is you know, getting a little older now. It should be probably updated to, to Trump versus uh, Biden. So these are all kind of you know, hot topic, controversial uses of the IAT. But that's not the only way it could be used. We had a previous research here in sport management who used this sort of paradigm to look at preferences for snacks uh, at sporting events. And I don't think anyone's gonna be upset if, if a test says that, hey, you probably prefer you know, hot dogs to hamburgers. You know, it's like, okay, um, that's not a big deal. But all of a sudden, if there's a test that says, you know, you're racist, then you know, that starts to sound very uh, controversial. And those are the ones that make it into the press. You know, I haven't seen a, a news story about, oh, the IAT says 
you know, people prefer hot dogs. You know, it's like, oh, okay. <laughs> Although that's uh, potentially important for, for vendors and sporting events, you know, it's, it's not going to make, uh, you know, front page news. So here's the, the implicit association test for the, the Trump-Obama uh, condition. And, and, and what you're going to be doing is classifying pictures of, of Trump. So you'll see a picture of Trump and you'll have to make a left response or a right response. So it's a two-choice reaction time task. And same thing with Obama. And in different tasks, there's different mappings. We'll look at those. Now, you're also asked to classify good words and bad words. And these are fairly, you know, I don't think it's controversial that, you know, cheer, laughing, magnificent, lovely are good words and gross, horrible, tragic pain are, are bad words. You know, nothing controversial with that. The controversy comes in how we combine these things. So there are some control blocks, but we'll look at the two key blocks. So in this block, what happens is on the screen, you'll get a word or an image, and it would be a good or a bad word, and it would be a picture of Obama or Trump. And you're told that if it's a picture of Obama or a bad word, you know, press E, make a left response. And if it's Trump or a good word, make a right response. Then there's kind of the opposite block where if you see Trump or a bad word, you make a left response. And if it's Obama or a good word, make a right response. And they counterbalance this to test different conditions so that the results say don't depend on, on handedness. But the idea here is that if you like Obama, you're gonna be faster in this condition because Obama and good go together. Uh, and conversely, well, I guess, and you know, if you like Obama and don't like Trump, then you're also gonna be fast at classifying Trump and bad together. However, if you're a Trump fan, then you'd be faster at this block where Trump and good go together and Obama and bad go together. So they run these blocks and they basically look to see when is your reaction time different? Now, if it's the same, then you don't have a preference for Trump or Obama. But if you're faster here, and depending on how much faster, they say you have uh, an unconscious bias for Trump. And if you're faster in this block, they say you have an unconscious bias for Obama. The neat thing about the, the, the Harvard IAT online is they test thousands of people. And it may be because you know, intro to psychology courses everywhere probably talk about this task and lots of students go uh, and then try it. And here are the results from, you know, about 65,000 individuals uh, for a few, over a few months. So that's incredible data collection. And you can show there are some people who those two blocks, they had equivalent reaction times. So I say, yeah, you've got no automatic preference for Obama or Trump. And notice the words they're using here. They're not saying you prefer one or the other, you would vote for one or the other, they just say no automatic preference. We'll come back to this. There are some individuals that they tested who, let's see, this is a strong automatic preference for Trump and others had a, oh, other presidents. Oh, sorry, strong um, automatic preference for Obama and this is a strong automatic uh, preference for Trump. Now you might think, um, oh, based on these results, Obama should win the election, well, I guess, they never ran against each other, I don't think. Um, but, you know, this isn't a random sample. You know, this is probably a lot of, you know, first year university students and, and, and that is not everyone who votes <laughs> in a presidential election. So what's going on here? Well, the idea is that if you are faster at associating, say, Trump with good, that doesn't necessarily mean you would vote for him. So what this test may be measuring is familiarity or a cultural stereotype. Maybe your uncle looks like Trump. So when you see a picture of Trump, you have uh, faster associations uh, because of you know, familiarity with that. The other thing is your reaction time here is in a very specific situation where you have to make a fast judgment. And most of our judgments in life are not these you know, split second reaction time decisions. So who you vote for isn't a reaction time decision. You know, could you imagine you go into the voting booth and you don't even know who the candidates are and they both pop up and you have to just press a button? <laughs> you know, that's not how we vote. You, you know, you think about it, you, uh, you um, look at their, their platforms and what they're running for and you, you make a decision. So something, uh, what your automatic associate might be doesn't necessarily apply to who you vote for. If you do the race implicit association test and it says, oh, you have an automatic association for black people, 
That doesn't mean if you're a hiring manager, you would hire a black person because you know that's a long thought out decision. So it's not necessarily relevant uh, to that. So although this has some use and is interesting science, definitely controversial in some of its uses, it's important to remember that we don't really know exactly what it means to have an automatic pr preference when it comes to these thought out decisions that are, uh, are more common in, in, in our everyday lives. And what they've shown in, in lots of instances is that the implicit association test is only weakly predictive of behavior. So you could take it and it, it could say that you're a horrible racist person, but that doesn't mean uh, that uh, your decisions in daily life are, are at all racist. So remember, you know, all data should be interpreted uh, with scientific skepticism. And sometimes when you see things in the news, you know, obviously uh, they're trying to, um, you know, get views and clicks. And, you know, if, if they find a study and take an extra extrapolatory step that says, hey, this test shows that, you know, uh, majority of people who live in Florida are racist, you know, then that's, that's uh, you know, going to gain attention. But when you look at the articles that this, that this research come from, you know, they, they, they never are, are going to make such conclusions. Um, so interesting example of application of CMS response compatibility uh, and how, I guess, uh, in, in many ways, um, the, uh, the media likes to um, extrapolate a study further than, than, it, than it, it, it has actually uh, gone. So that was our long unit on stimulus response compatibility. Uh, congratulations on making it to the end. I think this is our longest uh, module. And of course, good luck uh, with the test.